Dear Venerable Sirs, Dhamma friends, we are going to have the today's Dhamma talk. May everyone settle down and give the consent with three times sadhu sadhu sadhu. Namo dasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Namo dasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Namo dasse. Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhase Punacha Parang Udayi Mamang Savaka Abhikanti Nanyana Dasani Sambhavinti Dear Pentacles, Tamil friends, we are proceeding along this Maha Sakludai Sutta, whereby Buddha is presenting his own view or his own way of uh, explaining why the Buddhist disciples venerating him mean, venerating him, honoring him, revering him mean, and live in dependence upon him with respect and honor. Of course, before the Buddha giving his own view, the Udai himself or Sakuludai himself presented his view. He thought, according to Sakuludai's view, the Buddha is that uh, honored, revered, venerated and kept in esteem because he is eating less and prescribing eating less. And he is contented with whatever the robes he is getting and he is prescribing that or phrasing that for his disciples. So he depends basically on arms rounds and that he creates and prescribes for the disciples. And he is contented with whatever the dwelling places uh, and prescribe the same. And he happy and uh, always seek seclusion and he prescribed the same for his disciples. That is why uh, disciples are honoring, venerating and uh, living in dependence on him. That was the Udai's understanding or his presentation. Now the Buddha uh, disproved it, telling along these five characters there are some disciples much better than the Buddha. So therefore, still they are venerating Buddha. That is because not that he is due to his uh, the behavior of less eating. If it is so, the disciples having lesser amount of eating have no reason to pay respect to the Buddha. So then onward, Buddha is not, uh, he is taking a step back. And the Buddha taking the opportunity uh, to present his view or his omniscient view, the first thing he mentioned was due to his uh, virtues, uh, supreme virtues, the, all the disciples or other recluse live independence upon him and therefore that is no one can challenge. And uh, when you go to the commentary, it says it is a special or uh, higher virtues or morality the Buddha is having, so that is exceeding anyone's morality, so therefore that is a reason or valid reason to be honored, venerated and kind of thing. So, but in the Dhamma talk, what I explained was not that we are we can copy or try to uh, come in par with the Buddha, but if you wish to uh, have that kind of a qualities, you also must develop virtues, you also must develop the morality, and definitely we may not go up to that much of the superiority or higher quality virtues, the what I tried was the verifying that very virtues you are practicing or morality, does it 
true or verify that it is happening in the momentum, gathering the momentum and slowly, slowly, you are also or leading that it's your destiny. So if it is not leading to the destiny, they are become sila bhata paramasa or just rituals. These rituals really appreciated in religious circles and they are phrasing it, but the Buddha in his uh, Dhamma or teaching in direct way, he is not promoting, he is not encouraging people to go for these rites and rituals, but whatever you do must have a lead, or it must advert into the final goal. So can a yogi verify, so to say, within these 14 days, or within your life cycle, the virtues you are observing, the precepts you are protecting, or moral restraint, is it gaining something, or is it leading to your destiny, that's the thing, we must uh, be careful, we must be interested in, for that, my personal view is, if you observe precepts, or if you uh, try to be virtuous and moral, and if you are not mindful, you can't verify. So that is the point, most important, not that you are going to get big amount of virtue, uh, precepts, and you try to restrain yourself, but if you are not mindful to what you do, that will ultimately end up with just rituals and maybe self-torturing or you are indulging. So therefore, the virtues or morality or the amount of precepts you are observing, if it is going together with the mindfulness, Definitely you can verify within a very short time whether it is leading from the friction to lack of friction. From the egotistic idea to the lack of egotistic idea. Uh, starting from the highly conceited situation to the less and less conceited situation. And starting from the heavily craving and desire situation to less and less craving and desire situation. So therefore, even though you are religious, even though you are practicing virtues, even though you are observing precepts, if you have no mindfulness, very difficult to verify. Under such circumstances, religious masters will tax you. That is the worst thing in the human culture. They are making use of you uh, due to the fear of hell or this and that. So, the, due to this bad character, the Karl Marx and other communist people, they told the religious is like opium. They prescribe something, you follow it without uh, measurement or verification. Ultimately, for the future life or future betterment, you sacrifice the present assets. Ultimately, you end up with desperation, specifically at the deathbed. So therefore, before going to that critical situation, not only you must be virtuous, not only you must be made, uh, have observed precepts and moral person, unless otherwise you have this mindfulness that you may be following the blind line and there won't be any verification. Any other person, the verification from other sources and other people, uh, it is not pragmatic, not credible, so they are mindful, going with mindfulness. Under such circumstances, which one should start, or what is the uh, first thing, sila or mindfulness? There it is an open issue. All the other religious circles is, sila is the first, and then bhavana, and then samadhi bhavana and panya bhavana, so they try to prescribe certain amount of precepts and as far as you are not mindful, you have to depend on others' uh, decisions and they are, if you are uh, doing sila together with the mindfulness, 
ఓ స్టార్ట్ మై ఇన్ఫ్లుయెన్స్ బిఫోర్ అండ్ దెన్ లెట్ ద సీల్ టు కమ్ ఇన్ బోత్ పాసిబుల్ సో దట్ ఈస్ ద రెడికల్ వే దట్ ఈస్ ద స్పెషల్ వే యూ ఫైండ్ ఇన్ ద దిస్ టీచింగ్ ఆఫ్ ద బుద్ధ అండ్ నౌ టుడే ద ద బుద్ధ ఈస్ టెలింగ్ హీ ఈస్ హ్యావింగ్ ద ఎక్సలెంట్ నాలెడ్జ్ అండ్ విత్ దట్ ఎక్సలెంట్ నాలెడ్జ్ హీ టీచ్ డిసైపల్స్ దట్ ఈస్ వై అభికంతేన జ్ఞానదర్శనేన దిస్ ఎక్సలెంట్ నాలెడ్జ్ దట్ ఈస్ వై డిసైపల్స్ ఆర్ వెనరేటింగ్ హిమ్ ఆనరింగ్ హిమ్ ఎస్టీమ్ రైబియరింగ్ అండ్ లివ్ ఇండిపెండెన్స్ అపోన్ హిమ్ అండ్ దిస్ వెరీ అభికంత ఓ ఎక్సలెంట్ జ్ఞానదర్శన the knowledge buddha is giving in uh, pragmatic lines that is somewhat verifiable even though you do not have any omniscient knowledge with that of a limited knowledge according to the way the buddha is explaining it uh, you can have fair amount of uh, value judgment and for that the buddha says the జానాయేవ అహం సమనో గోతమో జానామీతి ఇఫ్ ఐ సే ఐ నో ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ అన్నోన్ టు మీ ఐ నెవర్ సే ఎనీథింగ్ విచ్ ఈస్ అన్నోన్ టు మీ ఐ సే నో ఇట్ ఈస్ ఐ బికాస్ ఐ నో అండ్ నాట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఆఫ్ కోర్స్ అ గ్రేట్ ఓ ఎక్సలెంట్ క్వాలిటీ ఆఫ్ ద బుద్ధ బట్ దట్ ఈస్ నాట్ టు నాట్ ఎక్స్ప్లెయిన్ టు గెట్ అ డిస్టెన్స్ ఫ్రమ్ యూ పీపుల్ ఆర్ వీ పీపుల్ బట్ ద బుద్ధ దే యూ ఆల్సో మస్ ఫాలో ఇట్ వెన్ యూ సే సంథింగ్ యూ నో ఇట్ మస్ నాట్ బీ అన్నోన్ టు యూ సో దే ఆర్ ఫర్ యూ మస్ నో అదర్వైజ్ యూ సే యూ డోంట్ నో సో దట్ ఈస్ అ వెరీ ప్రాగ్మెటిక్ వే సో దట్ పార్ట్ వీ కెన్ అండర్స్టాండ్ ఓ వీ మస్ అండర్స్టాండ్ దట్ ఈస్ వై ద ధమ్మ టోక్ ఈస్ that is why the retreat is so whenever we are to claim that we know the worldly knowledge is one thing there's a conventional knowledge and there's a absolute part so with worldly knowledge if you are going to say you know the moment you come across with the absolute knowledge you may understand what the wrong statement you are making only by the superficial unfounded knowledge without profound uh, absolute knowledge you tend to claim whenever you are acquainted with the worldly knowledge as well as the absolute knowledge you will not advertise you will not go ahead and say i know i know i know that any amount of this kind of advertisement and showing it off basically because your half knowledge is very dangerous this half knowledge is very dangerous so someone to understand i am talking with this not much of verified knowledge or half knowledge is the worst thing in the world because learned people they naturally claim we are better off we know to tell such a person or convey such a person yes you know theoretical or conventional or worldly knowledge but it must be reinforced it must be galvanized with the absolute knowledge they will never surrender so that is why even though you have a huge amount of worldly knowledge or not first and foremost you must have kind of a faith to listen to the buddha because he is giving a completely radical method to have an access to the absolute so in this meditation technique uh, we will say in anapanasati bhavana or in mindfulness in in breath and out breath or uh, rising and falling mindfulness on the rise uh, the uh, abdominal movements or uh if i am to quote or cite left leg and the right leg definitely even the dogs and the monkeys when they are walking they know they are walking when they are breathing they know breathing so that is not the what we are going to take time after observing precepts and uh, practicing regularly and sitting and walking 
there you have to understand the starting point is this theoretical understanding with that theoretical understanding your attention or your focus must be to understand the absolute i would say seeing through this worldly knowledge you have to understand the absolute that in meditation it call any object given maybe materiality feeling perception volitional activities or any consciousness two facets are there one thing is the conventional understanding the second thing is the absolute to make it more simple or to go in parallel with the physics you can see each and every object or maybe each and every phenomena has individual characteristics and common characteristics so individual characteristics are what we call physics so we know copper is different from the gold and from the silver so copper has that its own specific gravity its hand its conductivity and the silver gold or carbon so you have to understand in the periodical cycles in our classes when we were going schools there was a 230 odd number of elements we have to by heart what is the specific gravity what is the amount of electrons it is having and the weight and we were by hearting throughout and more and more you know it appear like you are more knowledgeable but and uh, when you go to the helium and hydrogen they are fixed in their cages when you go to the lower part the amount of electrons and protons increasing and if you go to the very big heavy metals they have number of cages because they are radiating some rays after radiation and before radiation they represent two three cages two three facets so ultimately the even this periodical cycle the towards the latter part you can't keep one element in one cage because it has many facets because of the radiation so that means not like hydrogen and helium you can't confine them to the one particular cage they are changing so but physicists started their best to understand this element is not dead it has many facets so make lot of theories exactly like that or elementary or reductionist theory we uh, the in meditation we are focusing to one particular object or one particular phenomena because we can't plunge into we can't ponder into all the objects and all the phenomena so therefore the buddha says as far as you have the all the objects and the all the phenomena you are a sensuous being you are always try to see all the colors and all the shapes listening all the sounds smelling all the kind of smells tasting all the kind of uh, foods and getting all the kind of luxuries and all the kind of pet ideas so you all the faculties are full of objects so you can't give a specific attention to one particular object because it is so notorious it is so monkey mind so if someone can someone wish to become a physicist or try to understand the natural individual characteristic he has to agree he must select most prominent most frequent more easy object and focus upon that and that is the most difficult part in the early of your meditative career because our mind was so uh, naughty we have given so much of fertilizer and the food it is jumping from one to the other without in a prior notice just like a monkey mind so in order not to have that kind of a variables to reduce the number of variables buddha says given at a time focus upon one particular object or take it as the primary object so when you sit you have to observe what is the most frequent 
what is the most conspicuous, what is the most familiar object, and that is the what you are going to focus upon. And that, when you are going to focus upon one particular object, your whole sansaric experience or your whole this life experience is going against you. Because so far in your life, you were in the varietal entertainment. You were entertaining this and that. Now, instead, you try to get your mind rid of varietal entertainment and going to focus upon one thing. So, easily you can go mad. No problem. Because your whole abilities are going against now. Your whole possessions, everything going against, so therefore, Buddha says, this is against the grain. You can see when you come and sit, and when you are focusing on one particular object, either daydreaming or sleeping. It is jumping out, searching different, different objects. When and where you advert your mind to the same, and when and where it becomes face to face, you don't know, mind is escaping, sleeping, boredom, monotony, uncertainty, fearfulness sets in. And as far as you are a householder, as far as you have never tried any meditation, you will never understand it. Because you are always fertilizing variety of entertainment. When and where you come and sit on a cushion and try to focus upon one particular object, then you can see 99% of the population starting meditation drop off. Only 1% may continue. No one can understand even on theoretical basis focusing on one particular object only you can have kind of a credibility or dependability. So how to do? One thing is theoretical understanding. The second thing is implementing the very thing. So that is why we are very like babies or beginners or like a innocent beings try to focus upon one thing. It's a long story but anyway to cut short in, cut it into short. Suppose one can keep the in breath and out breath face to face with, or keep left leg and the right leg, not only one particular thing, consecutively, and make assurance I can keep that particular object face to face. That it is the point where you can see you have got rid of all that varietal entertainment now you can say, I am with that particular object. So therefore, as far as you are in a non-object or your primary object or your object of meditation, you have done away with all your sensuous world, you are free from your senses and impingements and simply you are free from frustration. There is a frustration because mind do not Take, entertain, do not entertain the particular object, it is boring, it is monotonous. So you have to go prepared, whenever the meditation is gathering the momentum, you can see the friction of monotony, boredom, but still, if you can understand the mind is more with one particular object or mind is rather say, mindful with that particular object, you have to, it is a kind of a, your mindset or outlook. Otherwise, you will come out with so much of complaints telling when and where are the object I am trying to keep on a particular object, mind jump away, wandering, daydreaming, fantasizing. Whenever it is coming, sleepy, boredom, monotony, fearfulness, uncertainty. So that means you are progressing. That is the sign of progress and that is the first and foremost sign that your meditation is working. But when you are reporting, you are just complaining like an application for a divorce like. Whenever you are reporting this, you are so desperate, so bankruptcy, so are very sorry to report. The day you understand, whenever the mind is Lo, lo, give, to do away with variety of entertainment and come into the particular object. This wandering mind is the sign. And the sleepiness is the sign. So you know the two, two sides. Either going to the wandering mind or fantasizing 
or, or agitation or sleepiness. So when when I was meditating in 1979-80 in Nilambe, we had a very little group and many people complain, telling, I, whenever I sit, mind is wandering off. Or whenever it is focused, this kind of thing. Lucky enough, my English was bad, I can't report. But when I'm listening, the Godwin used to say, ah, you are progressing. No one believed. He says, understanding the character of your mind is the first and foremost sign you are now a beginner. You are now gathering the momentum. Other, other than you are self criticism other than you are changing the master, other than you are changing the place, other than you are changing your primary object. So this is the first and foremost thing. Imagine the percentage, get the, the, get the bus, get the idea. Very difficult. Because our whole worldly knowledge is disturbing you. It is asking so much of things, so much of objects, so much of phenomena, experience, but here you try to reduce to one particular thing, so you understand so far in the sansara or in this very life, anything you call a success, it's a failure here. So therefore, Vedra Jnananda used to say, any asset will be a liability in long run. All the things accumulated, is there will be a disturbance. More knowledge you have worldly, it's a more disturbance. But Upanitas had used to say, if you know the tactic, knowledge is not a burden. If you do not know the language, the tactic, then knowledge is a burden. So therefore, whether it's a burden or not, very difficult to say from the outside. One must have understand, whole effort is to uh, knowing that mind is monkey mind. Is always complaining, always jumping out, always sleeping. Never mind how many times or how frequently again and again you can apply into the that pretty boring, monotonous, simple, direct, in front of face to face object. That is your personality. That is your whole effort. And if you do not appreciate it, sorry. No way. So you have to understand, yes, it is a monkey mind, but how how frequently I can go to the in-breath and out-breath. I am taking the in-breath and out-breath and the example, and I am not prescribing it for you. Give me that excuse. I will use it as an example. So tell it. And now I am going to take, what does it mean by janati or knowing, you must understand the individual characteristic of in breath versus out breath. That is the way you are promoting these two steps. One thing is variety elementary is not the what we are going to emphasize or appreciate. Instead, we are going to go to the one particular object, and it also have two lobes inside in breath lobes versus out out breath lobes. So whenever with the whole effort, whenever you are face to face with the in breath. If you know I am with the inbreath, that means you understand you have given off all the rest of the world. That's the biggest generosity in your whole life. In order to be with one particular object, definitely you have to give up all the world. It says if you are to look into one particular thing through your microscope, whenever you keep the eye on the eyepiece, you have to forget about the world. Otherwise you can't look at the what is available in the microscope. So therefore focusing to oneself means it's a huge generosity ready to give up. That we can't do. That we can't do because we have trained or we have made the mind so naughty. So that particular thing if you can appreciate even for one split second, I know my mind is with the in-breath, that indicates my effort is successful or mindfulness is intact, and I don't know the rest of the world. That means you have done away with the tension related to the rest of the world, frustration related to the rest of the world, but you have a little bit of frustration because 
in breath and out breath is not a desirable object. It's a neutral object. Repetitive application is kind of a boredom is there, kind of a monotony is there. You have a doubt. Will that understanding will lead to nibbana? It is just air. It is just breath. How can that be so important? That is what you call the faith. Imagine when the in-breath is happening, if you can understand this is not out-breath, this is not a sound, this is not a thought, this is not a pain, this is in-breath. It's almost like Nibbana. Almost like you started the journey to know. And let the next time also in-breath happen. Let the next time also in-breath happen. Try to understand what are the characteristics or individual characteristics. What are the shapes? What are the manners of that particular primary object, so to say, the in-breath. Then only you can understand it is not out-breath. Then only you can be go prepared to the out-breath. Whenever it is happening, you can see, now I am in out-breath, definitely not in-breath. We are exclusively separate two things, even though we call in-breath and out-breath. Whenever in-breath happens, never out-breath can happen. Whenever out-breath is focused, you have to do away with the in-breath. So when that happens, it's a kind of a novelty. It's a kind of a craft, craftsmanship to keep it, it, but it never give the desirability by itself unless otherwise you are skillful enough to pick individual characteristic of the inbreath and outbreath. That can happen in three facets. One thing is, you know I am with the inbreath, not with the rest of the world or outbreath. That very understanding is the door opening to the mindfulness. The second thing is, you know when the in-breath happens, with respect to your sitting body, where is it is rubbing, where is it is titillating, where is it is give the contact, and that is then and there you can verify. So this is the second aspect. And the third one is, whenever the out-breath also touching the same place, what's the difference between the in-breath and out-breath? This is the only, or this is the maximum, or this is the excellent way of understanding this situation. It's called three facets of the breath. If I am to add little bit of theoretical understanding or towards the uh, book knowledge, as far as you know you are in the in-breath, but you can't feel the touching point, if you can't feel the difference between in-breath and out-breath, that's a, that's a meager sign that you are more biased to samatha than vipassana. But if you at a time you can see, I am in the breath, not in the outside world or out-breath, at a time you can see the touching point, at a time you can see difference between in-breath and out-breath, that's a clear, fair indication that your tendency is for more vipassana. That's a broader spectrum. So don't expect all the three dimensions to happen in one incident. Three dimensions happen, I mean, I'm in breath, it is touching on the left nostril or right nostril or top of the lip, or it is cooler when compared to the out breath. These all three aspects never happen in one particular thing. Your deductive knowledge, inferential knowledge only when you are writing, you write it. So that is the maximum or excellent way you can do it, but don't expect it to happen at this theoretical maximum. This is for the sake of theory. Imagine with that kind of understanding, with that kind of attitude, with that kind of preparedness, if you can see two, three breaths, in breath to out breath, out breath to in breath, in breath to out breath, out breath means, then you develop kind of a momentum, a speed, you never can imagine. Just understanding two separately is a great achievement. With that, if you can keep in breath to out breath, in breath to out breath momentum, one before the last time of Pandita Sayadaw, when he's giving a talk, he told, not a single person can imagine the momentum it develops, the energy it develops, the skillfulness it is developing, unimaginable. So therefore, for the first time when you are to see consecutively this in to out-breath, out-breath happening, it's so magnetizing, so 
absorbing and you completely forget about the rest of the world even the thundering happens even the rain happens even the dogs bark never prime so much so it is happening so even if it is happening at least once in your whole life and if you have to appreciate it that indicates you have the full potential to be a noble man in this very life it in that life if we can test it if we can verify it uh, you are not degrading yourself but it's a wastage of time because that is the way the beasts other animals are living but the human beings also have responsibilities and this and that and he take little time and focus into one thing and try to see consecutively what is happening amidst of so much of fantasizing amidst of so much of pain amidst of so much of sounds but he reports only the the direct touch how the in breath how the out breath can i focus my mind or advert the mind as and when the in breath happens can i see where it is touching can i see the touch of the out breath versus in breath so this is a kind of a sharpening of your mind you are fo- using the full bloom brain all the neuroses are going to use otherwise you are using less than 2% of your brain power so now everything is focused you see is total potential or total possibilities in the mind and immediately it break off when the fantasizing happens sound happens thought happens but that very reporting or that very understanding that very appreciation that very attitude never you can erase from your life till you become at a nibbana is making such a ingrained difference how to look at an object not only that how to grasp or panisa said is how to uh, suck the sap of the object the the dhamma sap of the object and reporting the same thing these are completely different thing in the world we are completely in the information technology utter mess human being never got into such a mess because they don't know what they are talking about they are not talking about what they have experienced they hear say this and that and huge colossal knowledge more and more knowledge more and more you be will that of course it is necessary for you to understand the language it is necessary for you to understand the grammar it is necessary for you to understand the presentation but you must present what you experience still still what you are talking about is the conventional truth regarding the inbreath and outbreath or we can say we are learning individual characteristics of the inbreath and outbreath for that two mental factors or jhanic factors are very important one thing is adverting or adverting the mind to the particular object that's called vitakka applying thoughts and then once the mind contact or be face to face or avenue with the object touch it and get the experience or taste of it in breath is cooler out breath is warmer in breath is in the left nostril out breath in the right nostril or in the left nostril and this is shorter this is longer likewise it's what what is the message it's going that very understanding is very very important only you can gauge yourself when you are reporting to someone otherwise you may be see it but you don't know the value of presentation you don't know whether you have communicated so otherwise brain is samya heart is samya left brain is samya right brain is samya it's a utter mess when this is happening all thing get alike and that we call we are mindful and this mindfulness and this alignment is called vipassana samadhi or it's a momentary alignment or concentration same may happen through uh, samatha samadhi also but functionally mahasi said oh is emphasizing functionally this vipassana samadhi and samatha samadhi is equal so you have to keep on practicing a mix of thinking pain sounds and kind of thing when it is happening 
each time you apply with the in-breath happen, you note it as the uh, in-breath or label it as in-breath or apply your mind to the in-breath and you understand through vichara or discursive thoughts what's the difference between outside uh, out-breath or other sounds or other pains so these when it is happening when and where you become skillful in this understanding of the individual characteristics of the in-breath and out-breath and if you manage to keep it for consecutively few uh, breaths the enormous unexpected thing happen you may understand even without forcefully applying the thought applying the noting mind naturally mind goes to the in-breath Naturally, mind goes to output. That's called familiarity. Familiarity, seasoning. When it happens, you can you feel like noting is a disturbance now. Naturally, mind is going to that. Under such circumstances, now the applying thoughts have done the job, so it is about to retire. And uh, discursive thoughts still working. That is to say, earlier you compared. in breath versus out breath now your discursive thought is comparing in breath versus in breath consecutively as the you keep on observe with the in breath what's the difference between the first in breath to second in breath second to third so that is very very sharp unless otherwise you have the first alignment second you can't even grasp in even theoretical sense so it's a so sharp when that happens you may see two in breaths are not equal two out breaths are not equal that is why the buddha says at the beginning digang vasa santo digang asa samiti pajanati digang vasa santo digang pasa samiti pajanati at the time you see long in breath a rubbing sensation happen or cooling sensation long a time when is consecutively we are observing sometimes become a shorter So now you are about to see the changing nature, evolving nature, or metamorphosis of the in-breath. So that has to happen chronologically. First in-breath, second in-breath, third, fourth, fifth, or after five minutes, after ten minutes, like when it is happening, it's an enormous. change going to take place instead of the conspicuous difference of the in breath and out breath the all both of them about to be equal in breath appear like out breath just a vibration or just a flux so when that happens so much of nauseatic feeling so much of fear so much of uncertainty easily you will judge my mindfulness disturb my concentration disturb something wrong somewhere so you never believe when you are to observe the inbreath to inbreath outbreath to outbreath consecutively so quickly inbreath is losing its characters ultimately it is come in par with outbreath so you can't label inbreath as inbreath outbreath as outbreath because they become equal ultimately you may find hardly you can see inbreath and outbreath but you know you are not bewildered you are not in the past and the future you are not with other places and other people you are with the breath but breath has changed changing so how to facilitate it no parents can teach you no teacher can teach you no lesson can teach you unless otherwise you practice with again and again discussing again and listening to dhamma talks with full of faith don't judge just report what is happening so one day you will understand in breath and out breath both appear like a vibration that is called now you are to see the common characteristics of the in breath and out breath at the beginning you had the very drastic conspicuous differences and through that ultimately is boiled down to the same thing So Upanisha Sahib is a master. He is the best in the world, teaching you about the individual characteristic and the common characteristic. It appears like very theoretical. It appears like very philosophizing. But I hope some may get the 
clarity. Each is when you look at the herd of cows, you can say this is a cow, this is a bull, this is a heifer, or this is a calf. And you can see individual features, no cows are equal. So that is how the cowboy understands who is missing and what is available, so he knows about his herd. So when we go, there are cows, but the cowboy will say, yes, it is cow, but it is a calf. It is a male, it is a female. This is with the one baby, this is the two babies, this is a heifer. All kind of differences are there. But for the laborers, they are cows. But he more and more understand about the individual characteristics of the individual member, he sometimes forget they are cows. They only know by the little names. But for outside, they are cows. They may be all Frisian. They may be all Ayesha. They may be all the Jersey cows or Kilari, whatever it may be. So all these things you can understand as far as you are engrossed with individual characteristics. But still, you have to go through the individual characteristics. Ultimately, when you come to the common characteristics, the, your brain, or to say, your meditating mind itself is evolving. That's the fastest evolving that we stopped 40 lakhs before. That evolution stopped because we only see the conventional truth. We see the superficial characters. You fail to understand individual characters, characteristic versus the common characteristics. If someone can go through this, it's a utterly successful treaty. Each and every matter, every experience, every phenomena has individual characteristics and the common characteristic that then you can say, I know. Without that, if you are going to say, I know about this herd and this is Ayesha, this is Frisian, this is cow, I mean, no one can challenge, but he has forgotten they are cows. So likewise, understand the individual characteristics and the common characteristics, either what happened from the Newtonian physics to the Einstein physics. Newtonian physics, they are defined about the specific gravity and the speed. But when the Einstein is going to say each matter can be energy and energy can be matter, in energy, can you mark it out this is energy in the hydrogen atom or it is in the helium atom? No, they are just energies. So this transference from the matter to energy, energy to matter, even physics or physicists, physicists go with this wrong uh, view maybe, but they can't do away with confronting that. They are now in a huge situation. They are out bound, bound to see the Hebron particle, that is the initial particle, before manifesting into the uh, visual objects or sound or anything. So they are reducing, 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 and it is so quickly changing. The, the basic particle so quickly changing, very difficult to take a photo. Fast changing. Like as whenever you go to the breath and when it is ceases to exist, ultimately you end up with energy and your observing mind also loses its individual characteristics. So that is why you feel vomitish. That's why you feel nauseating. That's why you feel cornered. That's why you feel lost. So, unless otherwise you go with the faith, unless otherwise you go with the precepts, unless otherwise you go prepared with the mindfulness, very difficult to go through this. And once you see individual characteristics of the particular thing, as well as the common characteristics, then you will understand individual characteristics are the bloody shit making all the frustration in the world. That is the tension. But each and every underneath there is a sign of the common character. The person who has seen the individual characters or external manifestation and the source, others will say it is like a magic. Others say it is like uh, some kind of a jugglery. But the Buddha says, I know, when I say I know, I am not unknown. I know it. Because I am not only know about the individual characteristic, for that also he is master, 
and not only that he can see common character he can find common characteristics anicca dukkha anatta all the common characteristics are fast changing it is so changing don't allow even for split second for you to rest that is what you call suffering but it is not yours this is the natural law that's a universal law so once it is confined or manifested or reduced into a common character then you can say this is me this is not me this i like this i do not like uh, this is my conceit this is not all the thing happen when it is come to the individual characteristic they are for you know only the only partial so they are for breath when you are taking don't think breath is a desirable object don't think that breath at the nibbana no you take the this in order to disprove it you take the in breath and out breath in order to disprove it you take the left and the right in order to disprove they are null hypotheses more and more you practice you find it has many facets it has many uh, individual characteristic and ultimately boil down to the common characteristics so if you are looking from that view point the way the buddha presented ultimately you will see when and where whatever the starting point when and where it is boiled down it's ever changing flux and looking at it is happy like a disappointment you have to bear it up it not leaving even for split second for you to rest suffering but it is not you not me not my not myself so that kind of understanding when it happens you can remember your past worries and you can understand how the worry how the frustration sets in because you have never seen this changing nature suffering nature and selfless nature so that is why you are confined to the individual characteristic individual characteristic is nothing but a frustration nothing but a tension so whole world it only is completely on the individual characteristics and therefore whenever you observe something you have to observe repetitively that is called anupassana or vipassana that's a technique of the buddha that is what the present day scientists are doing search and research when you comes to know that can gravity or something like that he design a research to reconfirm the same not once thousand times different places different people and everything is going to boil down to the same that's a scientific fact the buddha says all the aspects in the world when you boil down it is going to the changing nature it's a flux and it is leading to suffering but it is not governable it is not under your control so why worry so they have more and more you practice more and more you apply from the rising and falling to the in breath and out breath or to left leg and the right leg or lifting and dropping or lifting moving dropping everything more and more you go into detail with this uh, proper adverting of your mind focus of your mind ultimately everything is boiling down to that but you feel like applying it to different different things that is for your diversification of your knowledge but the very first day you to see the individual characteristic and the common characteristic you understand how much we are creating the tension how much we are creating the frustration because we are confining our knowledge to the individual characteristics so much so it is leading to frustration so the day you see common character it can't make you can you can't complain why the sun is arising from the east side there is nature and after two hours why it is setting you can't complain it that's nature likewise the changing nature is changing nature the buddha says whatever you call grasp it's me that very thing is the one changing and creating problem you whatever you have not grasp also changing it won't create a problem for example you say you go to the supermarket and you select a one particular product and on the way back it perishes then you suffer 
But the, you, what the left behind in the supermarket won't give any suffering because it is not yours. You are not selected as yourself. They also may be undergoing the perishing and kind of, but you don't care. So whatever you selected, you selected the suffering. Whatever you selected, you selected is something changing. But you, you assume, no, no, what I selected is everlasting, always auspicious, always going to pleasure, and it is assuming myself and it, I assume this as me, that's the way game is going. So what you have not selected, never give any problem. So anything you suffer, you have committed by selecting. Let it be in the showroom, no problem. Moment you go there and pay and bring the matter, then it is undergoing suffering. That suffering is your suffering. So imagine, we are going on Pindapada, whatever the food is happening, we are eating, and we are not worried about the kitchens and the raw materials and nothing. We are expecting the uh, cooked food. So no problem regarding the food science. Finished. Because we are depending on what is given. We are not going to teach others. Food science, no, because what they are doing is they are what they are eating and we are worried about the, about the cooked food. Nothing. So instead if you are going to have a cook and the kitchen and the, all the amenities, uh, not necessary to explain further, this is sure. So the, you see the begging, expecting what is happening, rather than selecting, choosing, and that is therefore mindfulness is called choiceless awareness. Mindfulness is called evenly suspended attention. Whether you selected or not, all of them are suffering. What you selected is inflicting. What you have not selected, not inflicting. So more you possess, more infliction. And more complain. So one day the Achancha, he was going and there was a branch fallen upon the road. He has asked the, all the disciples or the monks to help him. Oh, he also pulling. Then he has asked, how do you feel it? Heavy bante. They pulled it and put it into a, some other place. How do you feel it? Released. Once you hold, it is heavy. Leave it aside, not heaviness. No, it is released. Whatever you hold, heavy. So on, as far as it is crossing the road, you do it. Otherwise, let the logs die off in that place. Why you worry? So that is what, whenever you janat, if you know, you must understand everything coming from the same source. Everything coming from the same source, your desire, your likings and dislikings, your personality traits, select. That selection or choice is the cause of suffering. Instead, if you can be aware of the choiceless awareness, for example, when you are meditating, you never expect sounds to happen, so sounds comes. You select anapana, you de reject sound, then suffering. While you are expecting the anapana, daydreaming happens, thinking happens. You reject that, select Anapana is suffering. When you are doing Anapana, the pain happens. You reject pain, you pain and select Anapana is suffering. Instead, let that pain to come. That's what's happening here and I am. Be aware of the pain. Explain the pain by its natural characteristic or individual characteristic. You are perfect. When the thinking happens, be aware you are not in the Anapana. Perfect. When the sound happens, you know it is happening on the very, very moment. Your rejection, your reaction, your assumption is the one creating suffering. So therefore, let it happen, be aware, without the choice, then there is a chance for you to understand individual characteristics as well as the common characteristics, vitaka vichara, or adverting mind, or applying thoughts and the discursive thought is, tell you how to tackle individual characteristics. And when and where our mind is maturing, meditation is maturing, they drop by itself. 
that means you are ready to understand common characteristics so when it is done the job and when you are going to take leave you must understand now let them go and you will end up with you can't discriminate in breath and out breath nor no use of noting you may understand the flux so once you come up to a understanding or mastery or skillfulness it soon you sit one or two breaths time you see it is disappearing ultimately you may report no breath like it is not no breath they have boiled down to the common character when it come to the common character it is not inflicting you it is not giving any sign for you no remembrance for you but it is still existing so that is only you have to understand the common character so that is why buddha says when i say i know i not only know that individual characteristic of the external manifestation i know everything coming from the same source and janati pasati when i see if i say i am see i of course i have seen that is to say the breath of so to say our primary object has 11 facets so buddha claim i saw the breath only after seeing all the 11 facets not only few facets or uh, partial he says the breath has past form present form future form sometimes when it is happening definitely you know i am in the in breath middle of the in breath full of nostril the gushing air you can feel but sometimes you see the breath is disappearing end of the in breath or end of the out breath you know it was very prominent now it is disappearing it became just a past event and again one can when you can say when you observe in the incoming in breath out breath so you are you are waiting that to happen you know gradually it will be a very gross and then disappear likewise the breath you can understand the middle of it beginning end so beginning and end only possible for a sensitive people and people go prepared with it so they were at the beginning you see the middle of the breath never mind it's okay you start with it when and where you are face to face with the breath Uh, whenever you see that okay i can observe breath for 10 15 minutes or 10 15 cycles just be prepared how it is happening so that means your mindfulness or your diligence is going to give the real world meaning upper mind you are not delayed before the breath happen you are both prepared you can see the the uh, appearance of the breath just like before the dawn the before the sunrise the dawn happens so when the dawn happens you know the sunrise is happening likewise each and every in breath has the early signs precursor so you have to be prepared and even if you are going to say breath is disappeared not yet still is lingering off you have to be aware so likewise the breath so much of mastery sometimes it's very gross at that time you are very happy but sometimes it's so subtle so so much you hate it you report no breath if it is so we must have so much of undertakers and coffins here because this is 108 retreat so much of people report no breath and so much of doctors here nonsense but that is the way babies are talking is a baby language at a time it is gross at a time it is the subtle you report i feel in breath and out and now i don't feel the breath i mean it's, it's okay i know you are not lying so you don't know you don't appreciate the subtle breath and sometimes breath is liking or desirable and it is undesirable so when and we are the first time you are to face to face with the breath it is called beautiful breathing breath is so enlivening you aswasa become aswada so you you breath is so giving the vitality all energy but sometimes boy very very monotonous sleepish mind breath is face to face it, it is undesirable at that time you feel like committing suicide but you don't know is also yet another facet of the same very breath so you have to understand the gross phase facet and the subtle facets 
and when you are reporting you have to understand how crafty your mind is rejecting one and accepting one and rejected part due to the phobia due to your the perversions you never happy to report you never report but without that you can't enlighten you have to understand desirable and undesirable and in and out sometimes the breath is happening you feel at the nostril and sometimes as the breath is become suddenly go brain center into the brain shifting the location slowly sometimes it is going outside sometimes in sometimes out sometimes far sometimes near so each and every time you open your eyes and see how can the breath happen in outside because your rational mind never allow all the eleven facets so one day whenever you see you may understand when and where you see eleven facets what is the event what is the posture what is the time of the day you cannot be mindful there is no such events each and every moment each and every uh, posture any time you can be mindful may be undesirable thing you are observing but still mindful you are very subtle you still be mindful so therefore that day you may understand you may appreciate the word of the buddha uh, satha dipateya sabbe dhamma the buddha says the mindfulness is governing all the events whether you accept it or not whether you exert energy to be mindful or not you are born mindful you don't know that day you will understand the human life itself is a, an endowment it's a gift but we are so self critical always do you know my mind is mindful sometimes not mindful if you are not mindful who the hell understand you are not mindful that's your very mindfulness you don't know how to appreciate it So you go to psychiatrist, or you go for any medicines and kind of thing. Can I have any pills so that I can be ever mindful? Then you are mad. It is not. Theoretically, it cannot, because the whole world is relative to each other. Mindfulness is exist as far as the unmindfulness is there. They are reciprocal to each other. Be welcome with the mindfulness as the unmindfulness. So you find a reason to be glad, even if you are unmindful. then only you understand who am i other you don't know you are always showing others you are living on other sides you never understand who am i even with respect to the breath so that is why the buddha says whenever i know i say i know my disciples say knows i i am telling with the knowledge not without when i say i see is not the partial understanding or seeing it's a full spectrum therefore disciples no way they are to live in dependence on upon me but i am the very first person telling you the truth that you have not explored it is something new but that is i am the person and abhinay it is i am telling buddha said it said i am talking about the direct knowledge i am not in the superstitious i am not about the mystics there are mystics but i am never take them as a practice in the bhavana or meditation i am talking with the direct knowledge i am relating it to you even though you are not believing do it for split second or do it for consecutive two split seconds two seconds two minutes slowly slowly increase start from the easiest point start from the conspicuous point start from the prominent point but start from the what is given don't worry about the mistakes mistakes may be 99.999 but it may be but the point 1.001% point of the success is radical it is something against the grain so buddha is giving so much of courage telling i never ask you to do any mistakes i am telling something realistic or abhinay i did it i know you deny yourself you never expect believe yourself but if you keep on applying practice you also when get the direct knowledge 
and i am not telling without any base i am not telling the debased thing i am telling this understanding lead to liberation without that liberation never come as a blessing it never come it can install by your operation not by an injection not by anything you have to do so many sri lankans or traditional buddhists they are waiting for the buddha the metteya to happen they think that by a blessing of the buddha the metteya they will become enlightened so they are accumulating so much of merits who the hell to understand the buddha metteya what are the characteristic of the buddha do you think that he will come and give the address card to link here he i am the the metteya please come and have an appointment with me even if he come i am sure you will chase him away but he is not much an attractive person he never talk about the bull as cock and bull stories he is thinking something realistic even the buddha come he will the first person you will kick him off so many people in sri lanka is is a, a more than aids and the cancer each and every buddhist they expect it is have to happen through the blessing of the next buddha this buddha this buddha sasana is already ruined and nothing to nothing trustworthy do you know the sri lanka is the first country paying respect to the last arahant last arahant person the maliya dev maharatan was he the last we people go and pay respect to him now that coffin is covered finished sasana is gone meditation is no use all that the people are trying to become arahant sri lankan pay respect to the last arahant and that lineage is finished this is the traditional buddhism that is why buddha says i am talking something verifiable i have the base with that only i am telling i am telling something verifiable that is so any sensuous being can do but not with the first shy second shy third shy you have to when you are applying for that you have to have the faith that you have to have the precepts and the mindfulness one day not up to the buddha's level but verifiable level you can go up to that so that no archaeological or any research can deny because buddha was a human he was a living being he is not coming from the heaven he is not promising any paradise he is i am a human Are you also a human i also started with you but i am telling you the way at the beginning it is painfully slow but that effort is worth while mind you our parents never prescribed that our teachers never prescribed that our politician never prescribed our economists never prescribed it. our social reformists never prescribed it. but the buddha is a single army one man army keep on telling and he says he who ever understand is always ready to live in dependence upon him that is not because buddha is eating less that is not because of that he is the happy with the whatever the robes he is getting of course it is yes but the buddha says he is the only person can give a character certificate for the buddha and when we become mindful we also become a witness to it so i am what i am going to say is these all things are okay sila or the morality is okay but if it is not back up on reinforced with the mindfulness you will be just ritualistic and you may be doing sila bata paramasa and you will never reach the destiny you may be meditating on the breath 16 years 17 years but still if you can't understand the in breath versus out breath and someone is asking you feel angry and agitated no way no way the method is there and it is difficult it's bitter in taste a stringent in taste keep on doing one day you can do so therefore the buddha prescribed sakrudai or udai i say i have this excellent knowledge that is why people are respecting and venerating me so before ending the sermon if i am to say in each and every one of you there's a little buddha inside peace venerate him 
peace revere him peace live independent upon him then that will be increasing don't worry about the defilements don't talk about the mistakes then you are fertilizing mistakes that little buddha occasionally it comes appreciate it maximize it and for that you have enough ways and means two people are not different in finding the ways and means if you have the proper orientation so these discussions and uh, talks everything to make this orientation you may do you a simple or noble effort in sitting and walking but be prepared that is all the proper view and preparedness definitely it will not go in waste even if it is gone waste that your mistakes become your own teacher so therefore believe upon what is your mistakes even report them in a direct way ultimately you will find each and everything is dhamma nothing called adhamma in the world if you have the correct perspective hope this talk also help promote your correct perspective with that remark i would like to sum up the today's talk thank you very much for listening